So I've actually wanted to speak at PopTech for a long time, so I'm pretty stoked to be here. Um, not least of all, because when I found out what the topic was, I thought it would be a total shoe-in. This is easy, right? Rebellion? Pfft, I live and breathe that stuff. Um, <laughs> So I thought, okay, what am I gonna do? I gotta be, I gotta be clever and smart about it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hack rebellion, cool. And then I started getting into it. And I'm like, this stuff's hard. That's, there's some problems with rebellion, it turns out. Um, but before I get into that, um, I wanna talk a little bit about what, what's good about rebellion. Now, first of all, you know, Letha mentioned that I, I have worked in IT security for a long time, I like to love to hack systems and whatnot. This has gone way, way back. When I was a kid, when I was nine or 10 or so, I lost a tooth and apparently I wrapped it in a note that I put under my pillow and my folks took this out. Actually, I'm realizing there are kids in the room. I might be ruining your childhood here, for which I apologize. But anyway, my folks took this, uh, <laughs> but we're gonna do it anyway. Um, it's gonna happen eventually. <laughs> so my folks took this note out and apparently I'd written that, um, you know, I hope you like this tooth, I took care of it, da 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 da. Unfortunately, due to the price of inflation, the price of teeth has gone up. So, so when I was thinking about rebellion, I was like, cool, this is easy, right? Like, rebellion, I've been doing that for a long time, this makes sense. And, and I think that it's important to keep in mind that rebellion plays an important role, right? In a lot of ways, for most of human history, this is where our most notable progress has come from people challenging the status quo, questioning what we take for granted, um, saying what can we do better with something that's supposedly normal that you're supposed to just accept. And I think that's never been more true than it is today because today we've got more power, more access, larger networks, more capacity, more capability than ever before in human history. And we see this in a lot of the new products and new models and new things that, that are popping up on the market. So for example, it was very clearly an act of rebellion when someone sat up one morning and said, Yo, hold up, hold up, why is it that in all of our major urban centers, or at least in the US, the only form of transportation available to me beyond public transportation, buses and subways and stuff like that, are, are, are taxi cabs that are run by monopolies. We can do better than that, and that's you know, where we, we got Uber. Or it was rebellion when someone said, why is it that whenever I travel, the only option I have for places to stay are hotels, when I know there are hundreds if not thousands of people that have a spare room or an apartment or a house or something that I can rent. And there we get Airbnb. Or one of my favorites, somebody, and we still don't know who, sat up one morning <laughs> and said, you know why, why is it? that the vast, vast majority of the wealth in the first world is all managed, maintained, and controlled by very few people. And can't we do something with some clever mathematics to change that? Witness, we get Bitcoin, right? So rebellion, really, really important. We're seeing big changes, changes that have an impact on existing business models, on how we live our lives, on how human beings interact. And I think that that's really, really important. But there's some problems with it. And I sat down to look to dig into rebellion and to figure out what it was all about. And I started discovering there's some issues with rebellion. So for example, rebellion presumes persecution. Because if you're not fighting against somebody, you're not actually rebelling. That's just angst. <laughs> and angst is not sexy. I've tried it. It's not sexy. <laughs> rebellion, sexy, angst, not so much. Um, it also precludes equality, because if you were equal with the party against whom you were rebelling, that would be negotiation. Again, not rebellion. It requires scarcity, because if you had plenty of whatever it is that you were trying to get more of or get in the first place, then again, you wouldn't be rebelling. But most critically, and most disturbing to me, was that the more I thought about it, and I ended up sitting down with a bunch of my peers and asking them about it in an oddly emotional conversation, it insists on fear. The concept of rebellion insists on fear. Because something's got to motivate you to battle, to go to battle, to go into conflict against odds for which there are serious consequences. There's a risk of loss. So I sat down and thought about hacking and rebellion and realized, okay, well, if hacking is a, a kind of rebellion, what's the difference, right? Like, I did not like this idea 
that a lot of my projects and a lot of my work have been motivated by fear. Don't think of myself as a scared kind of guy, and it didn't make me very comfortable recognizing that rebellion, which is something I really identify with, had these characteristics. So I thought, well, I'll write a definition of hacking, and we'll see what the difference is. And what I came up with is that hacking was efficiently challenging the status quo. And the key word here is efficiently, right? That's the, the important element. There's a phrase that hackers use, or particularly coders use, called an elegant hack. And essentially what this is, is something that solves a problem with exactly as many resources as are necessary and no more. So for example, a coder might say, yeah, I wrote this function and it solves a problem and I did it in 25 lines of code. That's coder one. And coder two comes along and says, oh yeah, I solved it in one. And the first coder will say, no way, dude, how'd you do that? And if he looks at that line of code, and if he understands it instantly, if it efficiently solves the problem in question, and if it does it beautifully, that's an elegant hack. And I think all makers want to live with that. They, they want to create this sort of thing, right? So I thought, well, if that's the case, then how do we apply that to the concept of rebellion? Because it turns out that all these negative aspects of rebellion are not efficient. We don't do our best, most creative, most insightful, most innovative work when we're worried about falling under the wheels of the bus. Now there's times when rebellion has to happen that way, when you have to go into conflict, when you're fighting for basic human rights, and I understand all of that. But I think that we also use the concept of rebellion in our day-to-day -day lives, and we're missing some of the point because this is an essential motivation. So what do you do about that? Here I was, coming to PopTech, talking to lots of really smart people, coming and telling you that rebellion sucked was, didn't seem like quite the thing to do. <laughs> Wasn't gonna work. So I thought, well, let's, let's step this up. What would I, you know, if I was tackling a problem, how would I solve this? And the first thing to do is you break it down, right? I thought, well, what tools do I got at hand? And that's where I came up with this. Now, rebellion you know, physic you may not know. I'm really stoked to have it up there. One, because it looks like a dirty word. But two, because I've never actually said that word out loud, I don't know, I'm sure there's those of you in the audience that know physic. Is there anyone here? Any geeks in the room that have this? Basically, physic is a tool that runs on Unix or Unix-derived systems like Linux. And what it does is it examines the system for inefficiencies. So pointers to files that don't exist, permissions that are incorrect, um, programs that are corrupted. And it cleans those up and it updates the system for the environment that the operating system is currently existing within. Basically tidies up the room so that it works efficiently. And I thought we ought to apply that to the concept of rebellion. So the first thing that has changed in terms of the way that rebellion operates is that the world has changed significantly, mostly because of the internet. And this is not news to any of you. But I thought I could break it down to a few core principles and maybe figure out how to tweak rebellion based on that. And the first of those things is that there's a massive power differential in place now. There's a program online called the Low Orbit Ion Cannon. Anybody here know of that? Oh, okay, a few of you, I'd be a little surprised. Basically, the Low Orbit Ion Cannon is a real thing. It's not just science fiction. It was developed by Anonymous, which is a hacktivist group that exists online that have gone and taken down a bunch of different organizations, taken down the website for uh, the Church of Scientology, they've taken on the CAA, they've taken on lots of different companies, and they do it through something called a distributed denial of service attack, or a DDoS attack. I'm sure you've heard about this in the news. A DDoS attack is essentially orchestrating hundreds if not thousands or millions of computers all over the world to all make legitimate requests all at once to a single computer system. And the volume of those requests cause that, causes that computer system to fall over. Now it turns out this is actually pretty tricky to do. It's not entirely trivial. But what Anonymous did that was so clever is they wrote an application, the low orbit ion cannon, which rolls right off the tongue, that is so simple to use that all you have to do is you hit download, install, run. And you too can take down the CIA. <laughs> it's kind of better than a 3D printed gun. Now the reason I bring this up is that that is a massive power differential. This is different than any other time in history. 
Essentially, this is like uh, an indentured servant in the lower 40 being invited to come into the king's chambers and punch him in the nose whenever he likes, right? In terms of the ability for an individual to rebel effectively, we've never been more powerful. And the low orbit ion cannon, for me, is a kind of catchy example, but you might as well be talking about Khan Academy or YouTube or Google Docs or anything else that's available online now, free and readily accessible, because you can go and learn about particle physics to your heart's content. That's never existed before. So that's the first big thing that's changed, is the power differential. The next thing is what I like to call small is big. I do a lot of consulting to big companies, organizations, um, government representatives, and one of my favorite phrases to hear is, can they do that? Which I hear all the time because people are really shocked when they learn that their customers, their constituents, their clients are able to dynamically self-aggregate into parties or groups that are bigger than the organization that they're rebelling against. It's really disturbing when you, when you figure this out because it used to be the customers just sat on the shelf and were kindly acting like numbers. No longer. Now, if there's something you want to rebel against, if there's something you're not happy with, your ability to aggregate with other people to form a majority is as easy as this. Hit the like button. You're part of the group. So that's the second thing. The third thing, and the most important, at least in my mind, is that collaboration is now, for the first time, cheaper than conflict in many cases. It used to be when you were doing rebellion, you had to go around, you had to get organized lots of human beings, you had to get yourself in one place, you had to get everybody angry enough to take the risk of going and fighting whoever it was you were rebelling against. You had to engage in conflict. Conflict is risky and conflict is expensive because somebody has to pay the price. And usually the price is pretty steep. But now we have the option of collaborating. Collaboration can be rebellious. So I'll talk about that in a second. So what I want to do is try and patch rebellion. Rebellion, critical for me, really important. So in software terminology, you'd say you're going to patch this code. We're going to, we're going to make some tweaks. We're going to change things up a little bit. And we're going to see if we can't make our use of rebellion a little better. And the first way I would suggest we do that is to subvert, don't fight. We just talked about why it's easier than ever to do that. Why take go and engage in the high cost, high risk cost of battle when you can just as well make solutions to find, to find your way to what you want to do. Second thing is replace, don't compete. Not, I really love this as a, an ideology. Rather than going head to head with some big organization that's doing something with you that you don't like, just obsolete them. Because it, it turns out people are doing that these days all the time, right? You don't like something? Okay, make a video, put it up on Kickstarter, and find a few thousand people who happen to feel the same way and have all sorts of expertise and connections and resources to make what you want to get done happen. And oh, by the way, raise a few million dollars while you're at it. Because people are doing that now, all the time. This is very different in terms of rebellion. And then the last thing is to solve for better not for broken. And this is something that I think is really, really critical. Um, if we focus our rebellion on making better solutions rather than breaking down what is already there and is already bad, I think we're going to produce things that are better for everybody in the long run than we will just producing broken down old things that we don't need anymore. I think it's a better ideology, and I think it's something that we all as human beings have now inherited as our capability. Got a little bit of time left. I want to leave you with an example of how this can play out, a kind of reality check on what technology is actually out there today that we can use. I've been kicking around the idea of a project uh, for something called the Distributed Autonomous Corporation. This is based on a technology called the blockchain that comes out of Bitcoin, all very you know fancy cryptography-based uh, tech. But essentially what it does or at least the way I'd envisioned it and the way that I've been talking about it with some cryptographers and some professors of, of tax law, is makes two companies, um, one of which is a child company that's run by a computer program. So if you have an LLC, if you're a freelancer, if you own a deli, if you, you know, you're an independent person, you can go and press a button, run a program, and assign it control of your company. And then there's an umbrella company that exists out in the cloud, so you can't shut it down. It exists anonymously, because that's what these technologies do. And what happens is every time you get paid, you actually are being paid through them. They are your boss now, 
on a transaction by transaction basis. And what they do is they utilize all the tax planning strategies that the richest people on earth do. But now this has, a few, this has a few advantages. It turns out that that tax planning is extremely expensive. But if you democratize it to everybody on earth, it's suddenly available to everybody until the government realizes that, hey, nobody's paying taxes anymore. That kind of stinks. Let's close that loophole. At which point, the umbrella program just rolls over to whatever new loophole exists. So essentially what I'm looking to do with this, I know here I am talking about tax law. Um, essentially what I'm looking to do with this is programmatically and systemically using anonymizing technology, using cryptography, some maths, and a little bit of computer knowledge, is make a way to democratize tax mitigation until the government decides that everyone should pay an equal amount. Woo. So, so if I can do that in my spare time, <laughs> what can you do? Thanks very much. Woo.